Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third panel session for the series entitled Water Crisis in the West, Thinking Like a Watershed. My name is Craig Newbill, and I'm the Executive Director for the New Mexico Humanities Council. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce the topic for tonight's panel discussion and the panel moderator who will introduce the speakers. Tonight's panel, Rural Perspective, Farmers and Ranchers, is made possible with funding support from the New Mexico Humanities Council, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Christensen Fund, and the Historic Chemo Theater. If you or your organization are interested in representing your organization with material in the lobby, for the last two panel discussions, please contact me or any of the staff at the NMHC offices to discuss your plans and we'll help you get a space and set up. For those of you in the audience who are returning to hear tonight's panel discussion, you will recall that the first panel was focused on an historic overview of human habitation and water use in the Southwest. The second panel presented indigenous perspectives that addressed sacred, secular, and economically oriented attitudes about the relationship between human culture and habitat. The guest speakers assembled here tonight in the chemo will address several topics. From a humanities perspective, they will speak again to this relationship between humans and the environment. So the first panel was intended to stir the pot in terms of addressing global change and climate instability. The second was intended to overlay a cultural mosaic of multicultural perspectives that articulate a number of viewpoints held by indigenous speakers concerning nature and homeland. The third continues this dialogue about the ties between habitat and humans. It will examine the scarcity of water above and below ground level and explore water scarcity due to global warming, climate instability, drought, and over-extraction. So we are discussing ideas and perspectives in these panels discussions, and we are not relying on raw data or quantitative analysis, which will ultimately solve all of our water problems. We are not advocating one particular point of view or solution, but are discussing historic events and cultural practices as they relate to water. Tonight's panel discussion includes three distinguished writers and thinkers who will be introduced by the panel moderator and project director for these public programs, Jack Leffler. A resident of the American Southwest since 1957, Jack is an author, radio producer, oral historian, and a Southwestern water scholar. His radio series and individual programs include Moving Waters, the Colorado River and the West, a seven-state project of upper and lower basin states funded by the State Humanities Councils and the NEH. Other radio programs produced by Jack are The Lore of the Land, Watersheds as Commons, and Aldo Leopold and the Southwest. Books written by Jack include Thinking Like a Watershed, Survival Along the Continental Divide, and Healing the West, Voices of Culture and Habitat. As you may know, he's recently donated thousands of hours of oral history interviews to the New Mexico History Museum. Some of you here tonight may recall that he founded both the Central Clearing House and the Black Mesa Defense Fund, and has continued his field work in indigenous and with indigenous and traditional culture studies throughout the American West, Mexico, and the Cook Islands. He has worked with national and local institutions to include the Smithsonian Institution, the Library of Congress, National Public Radio, the Museum of New Mexico, the University of New Mexico, the Western Folklife Center, and several state humanities councils in the West. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jack Leffler. Thank you, Craig. Hello, and thank you so much for coming this evening. It's really great to see you here. I have to say that Two nights ago, which was the evening of Earth Day 44, I did a lecture up in Los Alamos. And there were about 60 people in the audience. And I was the youngest person in the room. So that gives you something to think about. As Craig said, what we're trying to do with these five panels that we're producing and putting on here is create a series of different perspectives for people to be able to understand various ways of looking at not just the water crisis in the West, but also what is it about our system of cultural attitudes that is erroneous 
In other words, how are we going to shift our perspectives around to be able to fit within the needs of our planet Earth at this point? Because we haven't done such a great job in the last century really has brought us to the point of major jeopardy. Let's put it that way. That's a positive way of looking at it. But at any rate, tonight we're really lucky to have wonderful thinkers who are going to, each person will make a presentation, a brief presentation, eight to ten minutes, about their, their own particular perspectives. And then after that, we'll have a panel discussion where we'll talk about certain areas that each one of us has a, a long and enduring interest in. Our panelists this evening include farmer, author, Stanley Crawford, who has done a whole array of books. We're very lucky to have Stan. He has a beautiful farm up in Dixon, New Mexico, where I was last week. And I was just undone. He has this beautiful field of growing garlic. And that's, that's a very spicy way to spend your day. It's a wonderful thing. Our second panelist is a, an amazing person. I've heard him characterized as not just a rancher, but a visionary. His name is Sid Goodlow. And Sid has a ranch down sort of near Carizozo and El Capitan, down on that neck of the woods. And it's a beautifully restored ranch that back in 1956 was pretty cow burnt, as a friend of mine would characterize it. And Sid has restored it to a beautiful, a beautiful habitat. And our third panelist is a person, another person for whom I have enormous respect. He's the director of Rio Grande Restoration, and he's also the proprietor of Far Flung Adventures. And his name is Steve Harris. Steve is a river rat. I have been in my life. I'm sort of too old to run rivers anymore. The hard part about running a river these days for me is all the other people who are out there running on rivers. But. And at any rate, uh, we're really lucky to have these panelists. There will be a fourth person on the stage with us this evening, and that is Cheryl Goodlow, Sid's wife, who has infinite savvy when it comes to running computers and making PowerPoint presentations. That's what I was supposed to do, but I couldn't figure it out. And she knows how to do it. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Stan, Sid, Steve, and Cheryl. Come on out. Is everybody's mic on? Yeah. <laughs> Got them. Um, to begin our evening, we will begin with Stan Crawford, over here on my left, your far right, who will give his presentation and inspire all of us, I'm sure. Go right ahead, Stan. Uh, thank you, Jack. Um, after the um, last, the first panel, I came to the first panel, I began thinking about what I was going to say <clears throat> as I was driving back to Dixon. Um, when Jack came up to uh, interviewed me last week or so, he said he was an optimist, which reminded me of a remark of an old friend in Brooklyn who said that an optim optimist is someone who knows how bad things are, a pessimist is someone who's just learning. <coughs> <laughs> I'm an optimist. Um, I'm going to talk about water. I'm going to allude to water, but I'm taking a somewhat left turn on this whole matter. Uh, the current drought is a symptom. Um, there's not a lot we can do about it. There's some things we can do about it. It's a symptom, of course, of global warming. And that, in turn, is uh, caused by a fossil fuel consumption the world over. And that we can do something about, all of us. Um, Conservation will take us so far, but I'm hoping my other panelists here will uh, give me some more hope here. 
the vision that I have is New Mexico eventually, northern New Mexico becoming like Chaco Canyon with a few campgrounds with taps and a visitor center, but no more water than that. But again, I hope I'm wrong there. On our small farm, um, we grow about an acre and a half of alliums and greens and other crops. Uh, we converted to drip irrigation uh, a few years back. Uh, you can actually see some of the drip lines in, in this image. <clears throat> um, and so we're able to irrigate this entire place and crop the crops uh, through an inch and a half pipe. Um, so we're, we're, we're using much less water than with flood irrigation. And there, there are many other advantages to drip, uh, which I was uh, slow to learn but came to appreciate. There are also a couple of disadvantages. Um, mainly with the consumption of plastic. About the same time, um, we built a constructed wetlands for our sewage affluent, which actually allows us to use that water a second time around on lawns and, um, and fruit trees, not on row crops. Um, it also, the, the little pond, which you'll, you'll see an image of, in a while, um, is a habitat for toads. We hadn't seen many toads, and all of a sudden we had toads back. Um, now, all of this helps, but it doesn't help when there's really no water, as was the case back in, I believe, 2004, when everyone in the Amuto Valley had uh, about an hour of water once every 12 days, and that was the entire Rio and Puro. Um, as for the ultimate cause, fossil fuel consumption, we've tried to deal with that in various ways on the farm um, through a number of uh, solar features. Uh, we had photovoltaic panels installed on the guest house, actually there, um, 3.65 kilowatts. Um, and we, uh, last summer, we rebuilt uh, and expanded our attached solar greenhouse on the house uh, and, and installed a heat pump water heater, which pulls heat out of the air in the greenhouse and turns it into hot water. Our propane consumption has dropped radically. And we're, of course, the electricity the power of the heat pump water heater is coming from the photovoltaic panels. Um, we also have three trome walls, which are basically very thin greenhouses uh, on the uh, guest house. Uh, you can't see it, you can, there'll be other images. And there are two on the house. Um, basically, the, the uh, heat is stored in the adobe walls and, and migrates through the wall over the course of the night. Our ultimate goal is to have enough uh, PV we need to, add to uh, photovoltaics to add. We need to add a couple of more panels so we can have a plug-in hybrid. Now, this won't solve or cure the drought. But by reducing fossil fuel consumption, uh, we can begin to stabilize the climate. There are several hundred million uh, people out there in the uh, developed world who could afford to do this. We did this. Uh, we're not wealthy. Uh, we had to borrow money to do almost everything. And uh, because we pay only self-employment tax, we haven't been able to benefit from tax credits. But I think it's so important uh, to do this stuff that we've done it however we can. It's been argued that the problem with uh, solar photovoltaics is that you have to pay your electric bill uh, 20 years in advance. But that argument doesn't take into account the external pollution that you would be generating in those 20 years uh, through fossil fuel consumption. And we're going to pay the price for that, those external costs. They're not going to be external for too much longer. They're going to become internal in terms of uh, climate dis disruption, insurance costs, and so forth. So um, to me, it's, it's a compelling argument to do whatever you can. Um, in a recent column in the Times, uh, economist Paul Krugman uh, noted that since 2008, solar panel prices have dropped more than 75%, and the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change has noted the substantial performance improvements in renewable energy technologies to, to, to the point that 
decarbonizing electrical generation, electricity generation is a realistic goal. I quote, so is the climate threat solved? <clears throat> well, it should be. The science is solid, the technology is there, the economics look far more favorable than anyone expected. All that stands in the way of saving the planet is a combination of ignorance, prejudice, and vested interests. What could go wrong? <laughs> oh, wait, he says. Solar is something that we can all do. If you don't own your own house, get to your landlord, your school, your university, your employer, your government agencies, your local businesses. Uh, some of you know that George Gundry, Gundry who uh, runs, um, owns uh, Tomasitas up in uh, Santa Fe, installed a uh, solar um, parking shed, shed uh, which covers a lot of his electrical needs for, for the restaurant. Um, perhaps, I don't know whether this is important or not, but it feels important to me. The nice thing about doing something is that it feels a lot better than doing nothing. And enough people do it, we might actually keep the, ha the planet habitable. Perhaps without even having to turn to that last desperate, complex, and controversial resort, geoengineering. Um, I'll, if, uh, Cheryl, you want to move on to the next slide? I'll, uh, this is the wetlands pond. Uh, we have an electric line around it to keep the dogs out. Um, as I say, it becomes a, a very important habitat, and we pump onto the lawn, uh, not onto the field next to it. And the next uh, show. This is our uh, attached solar greenhouse, helps heat the house, and, and of course we start <coughs> all kinds of things. Um, uh, a friend who works for us is here somewhere in the audience, Scott. Uh, he's planted a lot of that, a lot, a lot of those plants, and that's the heat pump water heater. Um, and Next, those uh, panels up on the roof um, are batch water heaters, 1984 Cornell batch water heaters, which are actually more suited for a more southern climate, but they work here as preheaters for the, um, for the uh, heat pump water heater. Uh, we re rebuilt them a couple of years back, so they're now running, I don't know how many years, 30 some years now. Okay. Uh, just another view, and go ahead. Um, that one you can't really see too well. I think that's probably it. All right. Thank you very much, Stan. Boy. I have to say, Stan is actually living a reality that I think it would behoove many of us to live because he's doing it, not just talking about it. Our next speaker is a friend from southeastern New Mexico, has the most beautiful ranch you could possibly imagine, and of course I'm referring to Sid Goodlow. Thanks, Sid. Thank you, Jack. I'm going to talk about water production, not, not water adjudication or conservation or any other of the terms we use with with our shortage of water. I'm going to talk to you about production, and water production comes from a properly functioning watershed. And New Mexico does not have properly functioning <laughs> watersheds. <clears throat> Neither does the Southwest, as far as that's concerned. So I'm going to show you why we got into the non-production situation. Um, I'm sorry about that slide, but that's all I could get of, uh, uh, my wife claims I was there in 1880, and. And, and should have taken a better photograph. <laughs> but the people that settled New Mexico came from a non-brittle environment where we had a lot of rain and no wind and warm weather and high humidity to a brittle environment where we have low humidity, high winds, high temperatures, and low rainfall. Next. The main thing I want to show you here is the one in red. And this is a paper done uh, at the University of Arizona uh, by Nathan Sayer. In 1870, there were 40,000 head of cattle in southern Arizona. In 1891, there were 1,500,000. So you can see 
what a massive movement of livestock we ex experienced in those years. Uh, 92 and 93, it didn't rain at all. 75% of those cattle died, but they had already done the damage. Next. I have a couple of slides here to, to give you an example of what happened after a period of, of massive livestock uh, numbers and uh, fire suppression. These uh, pictures are taken 100 years apart. Uh, our ranch is to the right of the big mountain there, uh, Carrizo Mountain. Uh, you can see what the uh, invasion of water-hungry plants was doing at that time. Next. That in the Pinon Juniper ecosystem and the Ponderosa ecosystem where we live, uh, the invasion of these uh, juniper, pinon, and ponderosa trees is just uncountable. From 20 to 25 trees to the acre, we're up to 2,000. So you can imagine how much water they use. Actually, uh, 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 in an area in the juniper ecosystem where you have 106 inch juniper trees per acre, they use nine inches of precipitation a year, which is half of what we get. So you can imagine what happens to the aquifers in those areas. This is just another area of uh, brush invasion in uh, Lincoln County. Can you go to the next one? This is uh, several photographs taken of, of uh, uh, young trees that have invaded grassland where we once had uh, infiltration of water into the aquifer and now uh, it's beginning to be taken up by these young trees. And of course they are growing at a rapid rate. Next. <clears throat> The uh, increase in carbon dioxide in the air has increased uh, tree growth, according to the USDA Agriculture Research Service, uh, by three times. And they've got proof of that. I've got the bulletins. And um, you can't see it, but at the bottom it says in Mauna Loa in Hawaii, they've measured a 2% increase in the CO2 content of the air every year since 1958. So. I can see, I've been there long enough, I've been on that ranch 58 years, and I can, I can tell you that I can see the difference in the growth rate of these trees. Next. You can see that by that slide how the roots come out about 40 feet from the trunk of each tree, sapping the soil of nutrients and moisture, and consequently no herbaceous growth occurs. Second. Next. Uh, if you go out 40 feet from the trunk, dig a little ditch, take a hand sprayer and spray the dirt away from the soil, you get this kind of root growth, uh, just like a, a hairnet, just solid under the, under the surface of the ground, and it causes uh, sheet erosion next. And this, <clears throat> this uh, sheet erosion ends up with the, all the surviving grass plants up on a pedestal where they're not productive and they soon die. So sheet erosion causes a rapid movement of water across the land next, and that causes our gullies all over the country. This is on the Forest Service up above our place uh, where we uh, have, over the years, there have been uh, uh, brush invasion, Overgrazing, fire suppression, all put together have caused these uh, gullies and this sheet erosion. Next. Uh, what we're doing now, we're going to talk a little bit about what we're doing to, to solve the problem. One of them is thinning, of course. And we do this by cutting uh, fuel wood and we sell it in Rio Dosa to the Texans over there that like to smell pinon. And uh, I have my own opinion of the Pinon smell, I think it kind of counteracts the smell of that other Colorado type <laughs> vegetation. Uh, but uh, anyway, next. Cutting firewood is uh, getting a little bit hard for us. We do a lot of it, but, but other, otherwise we use uh, heavy equipment and uh, push these trees up and get them out of the way and stir up the soil. That soil has been capped for 50 years at least, and it needs to be broken up. A lot of people don't like that, but next, I uh, think it's necessary. These are the kind of thickets that, that we clean up. Uh, it's just really a biological desert. There's not anything that really likes that. The, the wildlife, the, the lions can get the deer, and the cows can get the fawns, and the bobcats can get the turkeys in those thickets, so we're cleaning all that up next. 
And uh, when we're through, it looks, it looks really rough, but I can tell you from experience that a cat track is the best seed bed you can have. And we go back and we throw out native grass seeds next on these, uh, <clears throat> on these areas where the cat's been, and we, if it rains, of course, we get a wonderful stand next. And that's what happens later. Uh, if you get a, a rain, that's, this will be the next year. Um, we have in the past, I can hardly remember that far back, but we have had rain and uh, we've had some good results. We pile that brush against the green brush and uh, then wait a year and burn it. And we, get, we kill about uh, three or four trees for every tree we push, so it makes it more economical to open the country up and, and um, make it a, a more desirable wildlife habitat and a, a much more productive watershed. Next. In the Ponderosa ecosystem, we thin that also, and we, we have to pay for those things, of course, by selling fuel wood and vigas. We peel these vigas and sell them also to those Texas folks in Rio Dosa. Next. Uh, <clears throat> we've recently started trying the mastication method in these thickets. Pine, of course, doesn't sell as firewood. What we've learned is, is uh, it's very expensive, but this is the way to get this done. And now you can move on. Um, this hydro axe, uh, this was an absolute thicket you could hardly walk through. And we've left the better trees, and uh, they'll make logs in 20 or 30 years. And uh, we've got the ground covered with a mulch, and we went back in there also and seeded it next. And this is an area we, we're kind of up in the air about burning. We did burn this little area here and seeded it, and then that's two years after it was done. So we've, we've accomplished what we want. We've got a, a properly functioning watershed there instead of a tree thicket that's sucking all the water out of the ground. Next. We use herbicide also to, to accomplish our, our production point. Um, these Velpar pellets, uh, you can purchase them anywhere in a hardware store. One pellet will kill a uh, juniper tree. And um, next, um, this is uh, two years after uh, we used a pellet on that tree. And you can see that, that the area around the tree that was starved by the tree roots is now really producing. Next. Uh, grazing is another, um, I better talk faster, hadn't I? Uh, uh, grazing is another thing that we have to do to keep our management holistic. Uh, we use short duration grazing. We started that in 1971. It's now called planned grazing and uh, it's worked very well. Next. Riparian areas I'd like to mention briefly. Riparian areas cover less than 2% of the state of New Mexico and they're very easy to focus on. But if you don't take care of the uh, uplands above the watershed, um, <clears throat> riparian areas, you've seen pictures like this I'm sure where 50 years ago it looked like that, now it looks like that, and, and we've, we've accomplished that. Uh, the main thing that's, that's really helped us is in the Forest Service above us, we have all these uh, sheet erosion and gullies, and we get uh, a lot of good soil, and we don't get a bill. We just use the soil to build up the water table, as you can see. And you can see the, the trees there in the center are dying because they don't like wet feet. So the riparian area is, is, is becoming uh, productive. Next. If, uh, if it comes a, a long period of dry weather like we've had, these riparian areas become very attractive to the livestock and wildlife. And if you don't fence it, they'll absolutely just live there. And I, of course, I don't blame them. Uh, but we have. We fenced our riparian areas. Uh, the only problem is we can't keep the elk out, so they do. Uh, catch a lot of pressure from the elk. Next. This is an area where we planted some willows about 20 years ago and they've, they've really expanded and they are now holding the soil and uh, of course they use some water too so there's a little downside there but, but they are holding the soil together. Next. Um, talk about fire now. Uh, most of you probably have seen this picture. Um, this is just a good uh, Example of the re results of 150 years of fire suppression. Next. <clears throat> In the University of Arizona, they have a tree ring research center. They can absolutely predict the, the uh, year that all these fires occurred. If you'll 
Look, that center um, pith there was uh, 1700. You can see all the fires that occurred between 1700 and 1900. And of course, because all the fuel was gone to carry fires uh, after 1900, there were no more fires. That's pretty impressive. Next. This is an area uh, near Sholo, Arizona, where that uh, Rodeo Chedesky fire occurred. That was a, a Ponderosa thicket that was absolutely worthless. It cleaned it up. They flew on the seed from the air, and now they have a productive watershed next. Uh, on Carrizo Valley Ranch, we, we try to burn uh, and keep the population down by burning in the summertime. If we get rain and the grass is green, the fire can't get away. And this is what we're aiming for. This is a, a productive ponderosa woodland that uh, is not uh, a thicket that's, that's uh, unfavorable to wildlife and using up all the water. Next. And lastly here, I'd like to mention that uh, if we don't control off-road vehicle traffic on our public lands, they're going to do more damage to our watersheds than anything else has ever done. Uh, everybody now has got a four-wheeler or a dirt bike or a four-wheel drive pickup, and they've got to be controlled. Uh, we have done a little bit uh, in that regard in the Lincoln National Forest, so it's the only forest in the state that has off-road vehicle regulations. Next. We have uh, tours and workshops that come out, and um, we try to explain to them on the ground what we're doing to improve the production of a watershed. And, and I can tell you it, uh, it, it really registers with a lot of people that have never had that experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sid. Actually visiting Sid and Cheryl's ranch is a, has been a real pleasure for me over the years and a lot of good sense spoken here. Thank you. And finally, we have Steve Harris, who uh, is a great river runner, but is also in charge of the Rio Grande Restoration Project. And Steve is going to talk to us about some of our river situations here in New Mexico. Thank you, Jack. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here with you guys tonight. Um, I really uh, have admired uh, Jack's work with natural resources and with landscapes and voices, and I uh, think it's done a lot to, to help improve things, uh, at least the way that we regard our natural heritage here in the West, and so I'm proud to be uh, contributing a little something this evening. We're looking at the view out my uh, front porch of the Rio Grande in 2005. Jack mentioned I own a rafting company and uh, have a small nonprofit. Mainly what I've been trying to do is, uh, in response to the biases I've gotten from spending several thousand nights on camping on sandbars on various rivers of the Southwest. The home landscape I've selected now is northern New Mexico. And by the way, Sid, uh, we've got uh, a solution for gullying we use up there. We just throw the old car bodies off into the gully. And <laughs> <laughs> might, you might try that down in Carrizozo. <laughs> old cars. <laughs> Go ahead. So this is, um, everybody's got some kind of impression or experience of what uh, whitewater rafting is all about, but uh, we don't really have a product to sell out there unless we've got, one, water, and two, some semblance of a, a natural ecosystem, something that feels wild and looks wild and is wild. Okay. I do a lot of presentations in uh, Lynn Montgomery, Mike on or out there. You guys know it wouldn't be an Uncle Steve production if I didn't have a hydrograph. What's showing here is the red line is our water demands in the Colorado River Basin, human water demands. And the blue line is the historical supply. And what's significant about this is that they're, the lines are crossing, hence, Newspapers try to whip up some hysteria and sell some, uh, you know, make money off our, our uh, sense of uh, pessimism. Uh, go ahead. And in fact, 
the way that uh, policies work in the southwestern United States is that um, we can literally dry rivers up. We can give away more water rights than there is actually any expectation that we would have water. And so this is a picture of the Rio Grande, 1996, down around Socorro. Uh, it's a frequently repeated scene. Okay. This, uh, anybody know what this uh, canal is? Uh, it does look like the Los Angeles River. Did anybody say Central Arizona Project? That's what I was thinking. It's not the Central Arizona Project. That's the mighty Rio Grande on the international border between El Paso on your left and Juarez on your right. Okay, we're going to sit on this one for a minute because the thesis I'm trying to present to you tonight is that we have had a um, way of dealing with water ever since the Anglo-American culture came and took over the West in the 1840s. So from 1849 to present, it's uh, our relationship with uh, natural water courses has been to control them. And this is actually a picture of the construction of the Isleta Dam uh, in 1929. Go ahead. So most of my career has been spent on the Rio Grande, working on the Rio Grande. I've uh, tried to influence policy in New Mexico um, to be more river friendly, to have ways that we can deal with the uh, doctrine of maximum utilization that we've inherited from all of this uh, development in the West. And along comes uh, a case study. And this is the Gila River. How many folks have, have been into the Gila country? A right. few of you have not. This is in southwestern New Mexico. This is a backwater uh, area. Its uh, population growth is flat. Its um, dominant uh, economy is mining. Uh, probably second dominant economy is uh, tourism and outdoor recreation, and third is agriculture, all of which have their particular water needs. So SIDS kind of primed us for thinking a little bit about watersheds and riparian areas, and the Gila River watershed is actually principally America's first and uh, the lower 48's largest uh, wilder designated wilderness area. It's Gila National Forest. There's very close to a million acres that are, uh, are placed into protection around 1900. And uh, down in the valleys, there are small agricultural areas that uh, take surface water from the uh, Gila River and from the San Francisco River. And um, this is just, you know, kind of the aerial view. This is, this is some good country. This has got uh, grasslands at the top of the page. This is... Uh, not thickets, these are riparian forests, and you can see what the river's nature is. It's wild, it wants to meander around its floodplain, and that's the mosaic that you see in a healthy riparian ecosystem. This is uh, uh, very much unlike the other four major river basins in, in New Mexico. We've got uh, an opportunity here in New Mexico. The Interstate Stream Commission is driving the truck on uh, the spending of about $93 million in federal subsidies that uh, I don't have time to tell you the story of why uh, we've got this, this, uh, um, <clears throat> this largesse from the federal government, but we've got a choice in southwestern New Mexico right now. We can build a project. We have an opportunity to take more water out of the Gila River, which is fully appropriated and never makes it to the Colorado, we're going to use the Gila River Indian Reservation's water, and they're going to take water out of the Central Arizona Project. Hence, we've got federal money to build the New Mexico unit of the Central Arizona Project to take 14,000 acre feet of water, about what Santa Fe drinks in a year, out of the Gila. At the same time, the legislation was written so that if we don't want to do a diversion project, that we can spend that money on any other water utilization project in southwestern New Mexico. 
By the end of the year, the Interstate Stream Commission will send a letter to the Secretary of Interior saying we want to build the New Mexico unit of the Central Arizona Project or not send a letter. Sending the letter puts the wheels in, in progress to, uh, to begin uh, a project that looks um, at least conceptually like this. This is Mesilla Dam down in the lower Rio Grande. But it's going to be uh, seven miles up into the de facto wilderness, an area that the Forest Service calls the Gila River Primitive Area, put a barricade from wall to wall, and then either put the, the water in canals on both sides of the river using gravity to get it into off-channel storage in some, uh, some arroyos. About three or four arroyos will become reservoirs. Thence to pipe this over the Continental Divide into the Mimbris Basin. Some of it uh, presumably will be sold to Silver City. Other of it will be presumably sold to Deming. Go ahead. And this is, uh, this is the setting where that, where that dam's going to be uh, if, in fact, New Mexico elects to build it. The reason I'm kind of acting on the assumption, maybe you've noticed this, I'm assuming that we're going to go ahead and build this dam, because I don't think we've quite gotten over that era of development. Um, that's our first recourse. Anytime we find ourselves water short, we're going to go and look for another source of water. And so people are seriously talking about solving Colorado River Basin problems by um, massive uh, engineering projects, bringing water from Lake Superior, towing icebergs in, uh, multi-billion, probably trillion dollar uh, desal plant on the Gulf of California and pipelines to uh, Phoenix and LA and so forth. Um, that, that's just, we're still thinking that way. However, you can see that we've got this opportunity. We've got a chunk of money that's not, it's already come out of our pocketbooks. All of the federal taxpayers have contributed this. And there is a suite of alternatives that could actually meet the foreseeable water needs in southwestern New Mexico. Change? The acronym AWSA means Arizona Water Settlements Act. And uh, Arizona Water Settlements basically is how we got this 18,000 acre feet of water, or 14,000 now. And it's basically Clinton P. Anderson, New Mexico's senior senator so many years ago, um, in order to get his vote and his uh, concurrence in the, in the Senate of the United States to build the, the Central Arizona Project, the massive pipeline from the Colorado uh, River, um, we were promised this water. So this is our, our legacy from the 1960s. And uh, right now, the official estimated cost of this project are about half a billion dollars. Uh, as I mentioned, the subsidy is worth about a hundred million dollars, leaving somebody to pick up the, the bill here. Uh, typically in these uh, reclamation projects, it's going to be the end user that, uh, that puts out a bond and, and, uh, or takes a, a, a federal loan and pays it back painstakingly year by year. But in a, an area with, uh, whose largest county's population is 26,000 people, um, Catron County is less than 10,000 people and, and uh, the county containing Deming and the county containing Lordsburg have uh, uh, promised to have difficulty in servicing a bond to pay this other uh, unsubsidized amount. I spent the last week really grinding on uh, putting together some, some, uh, some figures, but, but the uh, Interstate Stream Commission has uh, agreed to analyze 13 non-diversion alternatives. Four of these are watershed projects, and I think Sid made the case pretty well that uh, Certainly, uh, a healthy watershed has some benefits. Uh, the, the fires that have raged through the Gila wilderness uh, three of the past five years have uh, created uh, havoc, debris flows, and so forth in the communities. Um, 13 of 28 uh, stream segments that used to contain uh, Gila trout because of the fire no longer uh, support Gila trout. Uh, water quality standards are not being achieved, and uh, you know it, uh, 
It shows up down in the river pretty, pretty quick. Uh, Grant County also has several communities that are not uh, going to have water much longer. Um, they've been uh, gifted water by uh, Freeport McMoran, the, the big copper mining company. Um, the mines are, are promising to close and Hurley and to some degree Baird are going to have uh, uh, problems with water supply. So the Grant County, where uh, Silver City is the, uh, is the seat, has a, uh, a $15 million infrastructure project that they would like to build. Um, and with that, they've got reuse, recycling, and the sort of water conservation that uh, those of us that live in Albuquerque have uh, become accustomed to, zero escape, low flow fixtures, uh, educational messages, uh, groundwater recharge, and so forth, and watershed restoration. So I know I've gone over time. I'm going to quit. Back to you, Jack. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Well, these are amazing things to have to think about. One of the, the thoughts that I've had with regard to what's happening down in the Gila and all of that money that's going to be spent if it gets spent doing this to the Gila, which is contributing ever more to the Central Arizona Project, which Bill DeBuise, who was here for our very first panel, and with whom I concur, is that the Central Arizona Project is conceivably the worst environmental debacle ever visited upon the American Southwest. It deals with massive interbasin transfers of water, and it creates a false sense of water security no matter where you go. Even here, even here in Albuquerque and in Santa Fe, the San Juan Chama Diversion is bringing in water from the Navajo River and a couple of other areas up in the northeastern corner. And uh, we've grown to rely on that kind of water. One of the thoughts, and I want to bring this up and see how everybody reacts to this, is the idea of using that money for watershed restoration projects rather than rearranging the Gila River. Is this something that piques anybody's interest and want to respond to? I think it's something they better do. They better start thinking about what, what they're going to have in the Gila River in 20 or 30 years if they don't do something about the restoration of the watershed. And Yeah, one of the ways this shows up is uh, in these farming valleys, particularly the Cliff Gila Valley, a lovely little farming valley. It's using uh, push-up dams that after every flood they have to to, to uh, you know, push more gravel up to get some head to get the water out into the leaky ditches to do the flood irrigation. And uh, they really, you know, since the about 1900, you c the record shows steady declines in late season stream flow. So um, many years they can't continue to irrigate their crops in July and August, and of course, uh, no crop production, no, uh, you know, wealth created in, in the little valley there. So uh, it, I certainly believe that uh, they should be supporting the idea of, of watershed restoration, of you know, good soft improvements to their, to their irrigation system and harden those diversions so they don't wash out uh, all the time. But, uh, but they'd rather go the route of getting the, getting the free water if indeed it, it is free water. Well, one of the things that Part of what these panels that we're putting together here are trying to focus on is the notion of thinking like a watershed, which isn't just thinking about the water within the watershed. It's trying to look at what a watershed really is. In other words, you can look at the horizons up and down along the Rio Grande, and everything that's coming down into the Rio Grande, that constitutes the watershed. And the watershed is a geophysical cradle for an entire biotic community. And it's that biotic community of which we share membership that is in a state of jeopardy due to the lengthening drought. One of the things that I think is important to try to think about, and people like our folks here on the panel have to think about this a lot, and that's uncertainty. How does that get you? 
Well, <clears throat> I think I, I told you this account uh, when you were up at the, at the farm, Jack, um, back when we had the worst drought that anybody could remember in 2004. So the, uh, we have nine acequias in, in the Imbudu Valley, or 10. Um, the commissioners gathered every Sunday uh, evening to figure out how to allocate the declining flow of water. And the first meetings lasted hours. Um, as time went on, uh, it got down and at the end of the season, the, the meetings took 10 minutes. They finally figured it out. The principle was that everybody would, that uh, under the, the Spanish tradition, everybody would um, share. Um, we, we haven't been adjudicated. There's no, no priority dates in, in the valley. So as I said before, everyone got uh, an hour of a, a small stream of water for their gardens or fields every 12 days, which of course was not enough to keep things alive. Um, but um, a commissioner friend, uh, I, I was no longer on, on the commission of my Asekia, said that it was the most gratifying community experience he'd ever participated in. The problem is that went on for two years, for two summers, and then things started getting better. Um, if something like, and these are volunteer commissioners, uh, 27 or more, mired over their plate paid. Um, if this goes on for more than two or three years, are these volunteers, and I'm now a commissioner again, are they going to keep up with this? So we're vul vulnerable over a very short period of time, maybe three, four years, uh, it could be all over or it, it could collapse, not that it couldn't be rebuilt if, if the water returns. Um, that's what I, I mean, that to me is the big unknown, the big unexpected, the big question. How long, how long can we keep doing this when in fact we don't get what we are doing it for, which is enough water to, to grow our crops? Well, this, this brings up a question, which I know all of us here have thought about for a long time, and that is, can we afford to keep increasing population-wise and development-wise in a habitat that has diminishing water resources. And I think that this is one of the big, you know, this is a level of conflicting absolutes that is absolutely imperative to look at right now. Can anybody talk about that a little bit? Future development. Well, I think we're gonna have the, the influx of population and the, and the development, whether we like it or not, we just got to, figure out a way to supply the water. And the way to supply the water is to return the watersheds to their production ability. And that's done like I just showed you. It's by getting rid of these water hungry plants that don't belong there. In the eastern part of the state, it's mesquite. In the western part of the state, it's sagebrush. In the other ecosystems, it's pinon, juniper, ponderosa, whatever. But they don't belong here. This uh, state was basically a savanna where it wasn't just open rangeland, and we've got to return it to a savanna uh, ecosystem, and it will then produce. One of the things that uh, Craig Newbill, director of the New Mexico Humanities Council, pointed out to me, oh, a couple of months ago, was that over the last two years, the human population of New Mexico has actually diminished by up to 20,000 hmm. people a year. Really? And uh, both Craig and I know people who are moderately well to do, who've been here for a while, but are planning on leaving. And the more people who leave, <laughs> the better off we are. A lot of <laughs> Jack, if I may, uh, there's, you know, there's the, uh, the demand side of, of things too. And uh, I recently toured some Mike Reynolds Earthship homes up in, uh, in, in Taos that use about 40 gallons to perform all of their day's activities for a family of four. And that's right in line with what the UN has established as kind of a human need for, for water. 15 gallons a person or so a day. What are we using in, in Albuquerque right now? We, we, yeah, 135, 136. So, and we're breaking our arms, patting ourselves on the back for that. And it is 
a, a pretty good achievement, but uh, you know, between the 135 we're using now and the 15 we need, there's a lot of opportunities there to, uh, to increase our resiliency. One thing that drives me nuts is uh, we just had a water town hall last week, and a lot of the talk at the water town hall was about deep saline aquifers, such as the one that lies west of Rio Rancho. These are fossil aquifers that's going to take uh, a, a lot of energy to pump. We're going to have brine left over at the end of things. And we're actually, the community is proposing to grow on that water supply, that finite diminishing water supply. And it seems to be okay, according to our policies, if, if that source will last 40 years, who cares about the rest? You know, one of the things that this brings up to me, and it's something that when we were talking the other day, Stan, uh, fascinated me, and that's how you are very much involved in co-ops and farmers markets and that sort of a situation. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the kind of a role they could play in the community as becoming even some sort of a sustainable political base from within the watershed relative to constantly being governed by government agencies that are not necessarily in our favor. Well, I, I think it was mentioned at, the, at the, that first panel with Bill and, and John and uh, Patty um, that uh, Bill McKibben was quoted that the, the one thing we can do in the face of what we fear is coming is, is uh, work on our own communities to make them more resilient and self-sufficient in, in, in certain respects. Um, but, um, and this goes back to the, the previous discussion, I was thinking that, you know, we're in really a rather bizarre situation for an arid state, an arid region, um, with the way water is uh, administered and regulated, the state engineer, interstate stream, uh, environmental, you know, on and on, uh, the, the various agencies that, that oversee water use. And um, I believe the Upper Rio Grande has not yet been adjudicated. Um, we collectively really don't know very much about the water that we do have. And so it, it has been over-appropriated, that we do know. But it's, it's, it's to me very strange, and, and I'm not saying that it's something I particular uh, desire, but um, I, I think our ignorance is, is startling, and I think it, it, the state agencies are also suffering from it. I think the state engineer's office is probably grossly underfunded. I was told in 1974 that <clears throat> by, I think it was Elude Martinez, who was not yet um, state engineer, that he thought the Imbuna Valley would be, this is 1974, would be adjudicated in about 15 years. Um, well, gosh, no sign of, of anything. Not that that's something I particularly want to happen. Um, but there, there is a, there's a pretty big disconnect between the reality on the ground, which I think we all are experiencing in, in various ways, and, and what the official, um, uh, the governmental entities um, know, I would say. One of the things that I sort of philosophically ponder frequently is how much our thinking is clouded by our overemphasis on economics and mm -hmm. underemphasis on ecology, actually. I think that's one of the big flaws in our system of cultural coordinates right now. And one of the things that I'm hoping is that the more of us who can really get involved in this kind of thinking, the more likely we can evolve a system of cultural coordinates that's more commensurate with ourselves relative to our ha habitat, our home habitat. And if we constantly think in terms of growth for the sake of growth, and I've mentioned this in earlier panels myself, but if we're constantly thinking in terms of growth for its own sake, we're really kind of slitting our own throats, at least in my opinion. I've said it before, old Ed Abbey came up with this great line, growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of the cancer cell. And that's pretty right on. Actually, Ed used to think about 
our species is metastasizing over the face of the planet. Now he had, <laughs> he had a pretty powerful point of view, actually. Another thing that I want to mention is that those of us in this room who are over 75 have witnessed a tripling of the human population in our lifetimes. And that's a pretty profound thought, it's too. So we have to come up with ways of perceiving ourselves within the context of our community. And one of the big things that I think that we really have to concentrate on right now is looking at our vast rural areas that we have and people who live in these rural areas and then we have people who live in our urban areas and it seems to me the only way we're going to see a way through this current state of jeopardy is within some sense of mutual cooperation and I wonder if any of you guys have anything you want to address about the role of mutual cooperation in all of this. Well I think the, the rural uh, population has got to do whatever it can to improve the production ability of the watershed and the urban population has got to do whatever they can to conserve it. Um, you know there, there's uh, the nat National Resource um, NRCS um, Defense service that, that will cost share as as a rancher like myself, uh, to improve the watershed, they'll cost share that because they know that what I'm doing is going to eventually benefit the people in the urban areas. So they, it's a, it's a government program that, that will help us do what you saw I was doing uh, here on these slides. So I think it's our responsibility as rural residents to do everything we can not only to produce more, but to conserve what we have. That's great, Sid. I, there's a, a model uh, that I recently became aware of. It's called the San Juan Chama Partnership, and it uh, includes southeastern Colorado and uh, the Pagosa area and the uh, towns of Chama and so forth, that uh, where the landowners have banded together and they're doing their own plan with little state or federal help, very much like what you've done, Sid, mm -hmm. uh, over the landscape scale. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, things are just getting underway, but it's, uh, to me it's a model of cooperation among, uh, you know, it's not just a little neighborhood. This is, this is yes, a large is. neighborhood and it crosses uh, state boundaries. And, I, and I'm pretty hopeful that this will, will uh, be a model for some of the other areas in New Mexico. If, if all the residents of a certain watershed would get together and come up with a plan to, to improve the production of that watershed, then that's, of course, that's the way to do it. It's very difficult to do, but that San, San Juan Chama project I'm familiar with, a very, very forward-looking group of people. Have anything you want to add? Uh, I was, uh, I, I'm always one question behind, but, um, the one nice thing about the farmers markets is that there are information systems. Uh, growers can impart what they know uh, about their crops and practices uh, to city people and, and uh, their customers can tell them how to prepare certain things, preserve certain things. And, and I think this is uh, a situation where our mutual water needs, rural and urban, can certainly be discussed and conveyed. I actually think that uh, farmers markets and co-ops could be effective politically. Mm -hmm. One of the th we just received four comment or not comments, but issues Good. from the audience that I'd like to. This beats trying to get people raising their hands, and so this is the way we do it. Okay, is there any political will and or many voices? in the legislation to consider alternatives to damming the Gila? And what do we, the citizenry, need to do to speak out for the Gila? So during the last legislative <laughs> session, we uh, prevailed upon Senator Peter Worth to uh, 
craft a piece of legislation that mandated that the money, this federal money, be spent by the ISC on these non-diversion alternatives. It got one committee hearing in which it got um, tabled. So there's a lot of education that could be done with the legislature. What we heard in that effort was this conviction that, hey, if you spend enough money, we can develop the water. That's, you know, we can't afford to not take some of this new water. This is the only new water in the state. All of those, those sorts of arguments were, were uh, very compelling. Uh, what we can do, I think, is what we are doing is um, zero, beginning to zero in on the Interstate Stream Commission. They're not uh, per se a political body. They're sort of a technical, you know, and, and it's sort of an honorary thing. And yet they have the responsibility to make this decision. And uh, if you know Mark Sanchez, he represents the Middle Rio Grande. He's the executive director of the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority. Call him if you don't. Go to a go to a water authority meeting and ask for uh, your two minutes as a citizen at the end of the meeting. Uh, sign the online petition. There's a 14-year-old girl down in Silver City named Ella Kirk that's uh, put out a petition here. And uh, at present, we've got over 6,000 signatures going to Jim Dunlap, the the chairman of the Interstate Stream Commission. You've just addressed another one of the issues raised here which is what are the politics of the Gila situation? That is, how is the Interstate Stream Commission leaning? Sigh. The, the, <laughs> these are either appointed or carried over by Governor Martinez. Three of them are from the east side and two of them are associated with the uh, Ute Pipeline Project that's uh, currently vying for some federal money. Um, the state engineer himself was actually the engineer for that uh, eastern New Mexico water utility that's uh, uh, hoping to do economic development with Canadian river water. The chairman of the Interstate Stream Commission is a beneficiary of the Animus La Plata project. Um, the like, you know, and uh, Sanchez of the Water Utility Authority, uh, you, you know, just spent a, a billion dollars to, uh, to wire or pipe us up to the Rio Grande, um, you know, the politics are, do not look good. But um, they ultimately, you know, they can't fight the economics. And, uh, and Norm Gom, who was formerly the head of the Interstate Stream Commission, took a look at the engineering, uh, determined that uh, the, the, what they're trying to do is insanely costly and that the engineering is they vastly underestimated the the engineering challenges involved so uh, uh, I think with uh, Norm's testimony more than once in front of the Interstate Stream Commission they will at least have the the clarity the stark choice laid before them and then if they want to uh, make the more costly decision then uh, those of us that want to see the Gila stay the way it is, it will be uh, um, shifting off to Bureau of Reclamation. One of the things I'd like to mention about 12 or 13 years ago, I was producing a radio series and I had the opportunity to interview Luna Leopold, who had done the hydrography for both the Colorado River and the Rio Grande region. And apropos of building more reservoirs and everything, Luna Leopold, who by this time was in his late 80s, but he was violently against the construction of more reservoirs, and he's pointed out that between them, Lake Powell and Lake Mead evaporate at least 10% of the water that comes down the Colorado River. And so he was totally opposed to dams. And that brings up something I want to toss out here. One of the concerns that I have, as we know, the water in both Mead and Powell is going down a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And it's conceivable in the next two or three years, the water levels will be so low that those dams will no longer be capable of generating hydroelectric power. And what that means 
is you can extrapolate probably that the coal companies and the power companies are going to jump in and try to create more coal-fired power plants. Or one of the things that I've seen is that the people, a lot of the people out in Arizona are wanting to mine that coal out in Black Mesa and out near Kayenta and sell it to China so that they can build more coal-fired power plants. And every time we build another coal-fired power plant, we're creating yet another heavy-duty breath of CO2 into the atmosphere. And so these are the kinds of thoughts that we have to really contend with. Uh, being able to be politically active and actually getting out there and talking to people who are our representatives is a great way to go. But I believe also that, you know, with what Stan has talked about with uh, the co-ops and the farmers markets, that's a way to politicize too and to actually get people active enough. The petition works, but the big thing is, is to really look at the honesty in our political system in Ward, you know, and I remember once a friend of mine, John Sanford, about 40 years ago, had a poster he gave to me. He said, search for truth and honesty in American politics. That's all it said. And I still remember it. <laughs> Did you find any? Not, well, <clears throat> when I think about politics, my whole thought is try not to get any on you. But <laughs> Another, another issue to address from the audience, what can people here tonight do about AWSA? My shills are out there, aren't they? All these questions are for me. Uh, tried to address that, and you know, it's hard. What, what, is it, uh, what, what does it take to be a successful citizen activist? Actually, one thing, what's the acronym mean? A oh, yeah, Arizona Water Settlements Act. So let's, uh, unfortunately, there's a little history lesson. Can I take 30 seconds on this? Sure, 45. Thanks. So in 1964, Arizona uh, finally prevailed in its lawsuit against California, and that uh, secured for them all of the water, Colorado River tributary water that arose within the state of Colorado, 2.8 million acre feet. And um, it also confirmed New Mexico's uh, share of the Gila River, which is about 30,000 acre feet. Uh, those water rights still exist. I don't believe they're adjudicated. A lot isn't in New Mexico. Uh, no, actually it was. It was adjudicated in that case. So, and, and those water rights are not entirely being used. A vast amount of them actually belongs to Freeport McMorrin and they've placed it in a uh, water conservation, uh, state engineer approved water conservation project, which means they're letting it run down the river right now. What you can do about this project as, as an individual is, is very difficult, but uh, certainly educating yourself how this system has come into, uh, into being uh, to speak with the people that live in the area and marvel at the, uh, at the uh, you know, how entrenched this idea of develop it first, you know. If it were money, we'd be, you know, cutting our spending instead of raising our revenues, right? But it's just the opposite when it comes to water. The default position is we're going to go out and find more and continue our wasteful practices the way they are. So uh, there's going to be a movement. There is a movement borning on this thing, and I think it's highly unlikely that this question will even be fully settled before 2020. So uh, um, there's a way to translate the fact that 83% of the people polled in New Mexico say that they do not want a diversion project but would much prefer to do these softer conservation, reuse, recycling, uh, watershed restoration methods. Um, we've got to translate that into actual uh, decision making. 
apropos of that, well, our next panel, and I'm hoping we can get as many people in here as possible for the rest of our panels here. And I really appreciate everybody who's here right now. But our next panel is going to focus on the evolution of water law in the American Southwest. And that's going to touch on a lot of this stuff. For example, we'll talk about uh, the 1922 Colorado River Compact. And I think it's the 1939 Rio Grande Compact. And a lot of these different things is... Steve just mentioned Arizona fought vigorously to get 2.8 million acre feet out of the Colorado River, and that wasn't the, that was a 40-year water war that compact the 1922 Colorado River Compact was signed up at Bishop's Lodge in Tesuque back in 1922. Herbert Hoover, who was then the Secretary of Commerce, presided. Stuart Udall regarded Herbert Hoover as California's agent in all of this, Stewart having been from Arizona. But the upshot was it took 41 years. It was 1963 when that whole bit of legislation was decided finally by the Supreme Court so that Arizona did get its 2.8 million acre feet. And that water had to be pumped up and over the mountains. It cost so much. Ostensibly, it was supposed to have been for agriculture. But as Dave Brower pointed out, much of that water has gone to development. And you look at Phoenix and Tucson, who are relying on water that is going down, down, down. And what will happen in those cities? What will happen in any city when its water supply is less than can supply what we need to make the city run? It's a big question, and we'll get into a, a lot of the legal aspects of these things next time. Um, one, here's another issue that would be great to address. How do we rehydrate rest or slash restore our watersheds in a large enough scale to make a difference? Well, the main thing, I think, is, is uh, concern by the public and the, uh, the possibility of, of the concern being so great because of a lack of water that they will uh, pass bills and, and uh, bring in enough money to do some good. I mean, it's simple. Thinning the forest will do the job. But it costs money, and the money's got to come from somewhere. I don't know if the concern is great enough. If this drought continues, it probably will be. But, you know, I, I'm familiar with the 50s drought, and, and uh, this could get a lot worse. Well, I've been made to understand that it is already. In other words, boy, who told me this? It may have been Bill DeWeese, but basically... It's at least as bad now as it was back in the early 1890s. And uh, that's pretty darn bad. Well, I'm getting signals from afar. <laughs> Brother New Bill tells me that we're about done for the evening. But first of all, I want to thank all of you folks for coming to water panel number three this evening. And then I want to thank Stan Crawford, Sid Goodlow, and Steve Harris, and Cheryl Goodlow our mastermind, and thank you so much. Thank you. Please come back May 29th, I believe it is.